I am Jim Leha. I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement at UMS, also known as University Musical Society. I also happen to be a proud alumnus of the Penny Stamp School of Art and Design, class of 2007. Go Blue! Um, I'm here today filling in for Christina. She is on the road, as you know, always looking for great talent to bring back here for you, and she will be back next week. All right, a big thank you to our partners today for their support of the program, the U of M Museum of Art, uh, AIGA Detroit, the Professional Association for Design, and our series partners, Arts at Michigan and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Thank you to our sponsors. Yeah, it's okay, give them a round of applause. They make all of this possible. All right, a few announcements before we get to the fun part. Um, today's international fair in the lobby of the Michigan Theater is a chance to highlight the importance of international education at the Stamp School, where all students are required to gain international experience. I myself went to Suriname on a trip led by Nick Tobier. Uh, the school is proud uh, to announce its summer 2013 programs in Tanzan Tan Tanzania, Japan, Italy, and Indonesia. Additional information on these programs will be emailed to students. Uh, finally, the international exhibition in the Warren Robbins Gallery opens tomorrow afternoon. The show highlights work created or inspired by students' experiences on their international trips. Next week, Chris Jordan will be with us uh, as the featured uh, artist and presenter. The lecture is presented in conjunction with a U of M campus-wide exhibition taking place in the Stamp School of Art and Design's John Paul Slusser Gallery with select pieces at the Ross School of Business, College of Engineering, Institute for the Humanities, the School of Natural Resources and Environment, and Palmer Commons. You'll find flyers in the lobby with a map of location, so please check out the exhibition and join us next week for the artist's lecture. Just a reminder, there will be a Q&A with Stefan directly following the presentation in the screening room around the corner and to the left as you exit. Please turn off all of your cell phones, your laptops, anything that makes noise, vibrates, you know, whatever. And now, to properly introduce our guest, I'm going to invite uh, one of our own professors, the Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist, filmmaker who recently premiered his new film, Shenandoah, and Associate Professor of Art and Design, David Turnley. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, proud and excited to introduce to you one of the real rock stars and one of the best designers in the world. Before I do that, I want to preface that I actually, in an interesting way, got to know Stefan long before, as a friend, long before I had any clue what he actually does in his life professionally. Um, 13 years ago, my best friend and I would meet for coffee every morning at the French Roast on 6th Avenue in New York City. And one day, my friend brought along this tall, lanky, six-foot-five Austrian named Stefan around seven in the morning. And it, it seemed that, turned out that Stefan and my friend George would meet once a week and go for long walks or runs. And then I found out that actually my friend George, who'd been sort of a world-class marathon runner, um, at the request of Stefan, uh, decided together to spend what effectively ended up being a year training for a marathon. And I know that for Stefan, I could see as we talked and followed this over the next year that this was for him like climbing Mount Everest. Um, and he was so excited about it. And so on the day of the marathon, I decided to go up to Central Park and try to be at the finish line um, with my camera to make some pictures of my two friends, George and Stefan. So I, I got up there at about the three hour mark, thinking I'd probably have a little bit of time. Well, it turned out actually there were a couple more hours that I stood there. Um, and at about five hours, sure enough, I see coming around the corner these two friends of mine, both wearing matching white t-shirts. And on the white t-shirts, they each had the names of their then girlfriends. In Stefan's case, it was Annie. And here's this six foot five man trudging along, barely ma making it in this wonderful, exuberant, enthusiastic American audience seeing the name Annie, thought, they all thought that Stefan's name was Annie and they're cheering, go Annie! 
And so suddenly I see this, again, this very tall man with these very long arms, like the rock star he is, high-fiving all of his American audience. Um, as I evolved in my friendship and became very aware of just how unbelievably talented um, Stefan is, uh, after 20 years of photographing Nelson Mandela, after his release from prison, I was publishing a book and Stefan unbelievably graciously offered to design the cover. And he said one day, so here's what we do, come over to my rooftop studio in Chelsea and I want you to bring a stack of photographs and we'll sit down and we'll look at them and we'll talk. So I did. And the experience sort of went like this. All of a sudden I got there, he poured me a cup of tea and we sat down and he sort of suddenly transformed. This, um, this friend of mine suddenly went into this kind of very focused, uh, zen-like sort of quality. He started going through the photographs in a very concentrated way. And most of them were representations of Nelson Mandela in one, in one position or another. And then he came to this photograph that was absolutely the most unlikely image of the group to be the cover of the book. It was a, a photograph of thousands of South Africans who had collected in a football stadium to wait for the arrival of Nelson Mandela just after his release from prison. And you saw in the image these arms reaching through a fence in this euphoria and this excitement. And then in sort of one corner of the image skewed was a poster of Nelson Mandela. And when he caught to this image, he stopped and he looked at it and he sort of tilted it around a little bit. And then he pulled out a piece of paper and he started to sketch. And he sketched the image and then started to integrate this kind of distressed type. And then he brought out some color and he started to work with color that was reflected in the indigenous colors of the image. And very shortly, we had an amazing cover of my book. And what the cover did, which was so extraordinary, and I think which is so emblematic of both Stefan as a human being and of his work, is that it was visceral, it was raw, it was primal. You feel this cover. You don't think about it, you feel it. Last night I was on the phone with my friend George, knowing I was going to introduce him. I said, George, tell me an anecdote about uh, Stefan that you enjoy. And he says, well, actually, uh, Dave, he says the story that I wanted to tell is one that people know. He said in 1997, uh, Stefan was asked by Mick Jagger to do the Bridges to Babylon uh, album cover. And he used the representation uh, of an Assyrian kind of lion sculpture. And as he was, um, according to Stefan, as he was designing this cover, he wanted, so the, the lions, I don't know if you've seen it, but the lions up on his rear haunches, and Stefan wanted to design into his representation testicles. And then he thought, oh, I don't know. Um, I think probably the decorum and the protocol of, of mainstream album covers probably shouldn't have testicles. And the cover was done and, and it became an in incredible success and the stones were over the moon about the cover. And several months later, Stefan uh, shared that he had uh, been with Mick Jagger and Jagger says, Stefan, God, I love that album cover. It's like the best album cover we've ever had. I just wish you'd put balls on the lion. <laughs> and Stefan decided at that point that never again in his methodology would he in fact self-censor his impulses, that he would wait for a client to push back, not himself. Stefan Segmeister was born in Austria and lives and works in New York. He, was, he has worked for the Rolling Stones, the Talking Heads, Lou Reed, the Guggenheim Museum, and Levi's. Exhibitions on Segmeister's work have been mounted in New York, Philadelphia, Tokyo, Osaka, Seoul, Paris, Lausanne, Zurich, Vienna, Prague, Cologne, and Berlin. It is my honor to introduce to you my six foot five dear friend, rock star, and one of the best designers in the world, Stefan Segmeister. Thanks, Eddie. Hello, everybody. As uh, David so nicely already said in the introduction, uh, I'm a designer. I run a small studio in New York City. Uh, the studio has been running for 19 years, and 
very recently I took on a uh, partner, a very young designer called Jessica Walsh, and uh, we sent out this announcement card that it's now called Sagmeister and Walsh. Uh, that's, if you were wondering where the balls from that story went from, uh, from the Assyrian lion, that's probably where they are. Uh, yeah, we printed it, and then Jesse sent it to one blog, and after a week it was posted on literally hundreds, possibly thousands of blogs. So by the time the card came back from the printer, we basically could throw, well, we never sent it out because it made no sense anymore. Um, in 1993, when I actually opened the studio, uh, Jessica already had a love of nudity, clearly, as you can see. <laughs> And the entire idea was reflective of this opening card from 1993. Uh, I might remind you that this was the days before Photoshop. <laughs> and I found... Uh, I'll talk later about these in, the, uh, in these 19 years. Every seven years, I uh, take a sabbatical a year out to really explore things that we don't have time to explore when the studio is running full time. And in my second sabbatical in Indonesia, that same friend that David had just mentioned in the, uh, in the opening, George, had come by in Bali, looked at all the stuff that we were designing, which at the time was furniture, and sort of said, that looks pretty dinky to me. I think you're wasting your time. And I didn't really want to hear that at the time. Well, I probably never want to hear that, but I had to concede that he had a point. And I was thinking for a number of days what it would make, what it could be that would be a better use of my time, that would be somehow more meaningful. And the idea to create a film on happiness came about, mostly because I had given a talk on design and happiness before that all of us had gotten good feedback. So that was the decision, and because I was in Bali and because I'm a graphic designer, I started with the titles. Uh, in this case, uh, this is my neighbor John's pig that is doing the typography. And it looked okay, but maybe a little bit too funky, but we were in Bali and only five minutes away from the monkey forest, so we could have a bunch of monkeys, you know, do three separate words properly. Uh, you can see they already got the film. Do they get the other stuff correct? Yes, they do. Uh, and it, you know, I mean, from a pure typographic point of view, you know, the tracking and the A between the A and the P is not perfect, but, uh... <laughs> it was good enough for the time. Uh, can we get for a second some house lights on and I'll do a little survey? Excellent. So who feels like, my God, is this place full? Wow. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, uh, who feels, who is a zero? Who feels like shit? <laughs> Nobody in Ann Arbor feels like shit. Uh, number two, who feels pretty bad? I think somebody in the back. Two people, pretty bad. Who is bored? Number four. One, two... I'm like five minutes into it. Are you guys already bored? Uh, things are okay, number six. That's clearly a hundred people. Uh, I feel good, number eight. Wow. That's at least 500, 400. Ten, I love life. 
oh my God. That's another 300. So about 200 of you feel absolutely nothing. <laughs> the rest, pretty, pretty fine. Okay, we can kill the lights again. And uh, I, of course, already knew that you guys are going to feel pretty good. Uh, the United States is, while not the happiest country, definitely quite, uh, quite up there, uh, always behind Switzerland and Denmark. <laughs> I'm normally not one for definitions, but because the subject is so gigantic, I'll quickly talk about it. What I find, what I found helpful is to define it by length of time. So you have very short-term happinesses like bliss, orgasms, joy, pleasure. You have mid-term things, things like spending a satisfied afternoon. And then you have long-term things like finding what you're good for in life, you know, really fulfilling your potential. From a different point of view, it's, as an individual, I can look at it as an activity. So, the pure fact that you came today at quarter past five and decided to go to a lecture, no matter what, if that lecture is good or bad, was already a decision that has a good potential to make you happier, simply because it's non-repetitive. I assume you didn't go to a lecture yesterday afternoon, at least not on the same subject. Uh, life conditions play, of course, a role. Where do you live, what do you do, all the big things, but it plays a surprisingly small role, and then you have genes. A lot of psychologists think that it's basically 50% that genetic that you are born, that how you, like, the way that you are born uh, is responsible for about half of how happy you are. The reason they think so is from twin research. What you see here is two identical twins separated at birth. This is the most, this, the, the most famous pair of them, but there is enough of these twins out there identical twins separated at birth, that are to allow proper scientific research. The Giggle twins are famous because they have the same laugh, and they, are, uh, they only met in their 40s. Uh, one grew up in the south of the UK, one grew up in the uh, uh, north of London. Uh, lower middle class, upper middle class, uh, they have the same laugh, they uh, had a miscarriage at the same time. They both married husbands that, uh, that they met at a church dance. And probably most eerily, eerily is that when a researcher asked them separately to write down the first sentence that would come to their minds, uh, Daphne, the one on the left, wrote down, the cat sits on the map, but she misspelled cat. She spelled it with an S. So she wrote down, the set sits on the map, which makes no sense whatsoever. And her twin sister wrote down the same sentence with the same spelling mistake. So this is quite voodoo-like uh, when it uh, gets to that. And I, one of the reasons that I was interested in doing a movie like this was because I knew that it's going to force me to do research that I wouldn't do if I wouldn't have a project. So I'll sum up about three dozen books on uh, the subject in 45 seconds. <laughs> Women are as happy as men. Climate plays no role. People in Buffalo, New York State, shittiest climate in the United States, uh, are as happy as they are in San Diego, best climate of the United States. Money plays only a role up to 50, that's just been up to, up to $75,000 a year. Meaning that after that, it's the, uh, the happiness difference is too small to be measured. This comes of a giant 
uh, survey from Gallup with 650,000 participants. Race plays no role. Uh, white people are as happy as black people. Age plays a tiny role. Older people are a little bit happier than younger people. Ugly people are as unhappy or as happy as supermodels. Uh, surprisingly, health problems, as long as they are manageable, play a very small role. And here it starts to really change. If you're very outgoing, if you're an extrovert, if you're sociable, if you have a lot of friends, and if you have good friends, you are happier. If you are religious, you are happier. And if you are married, you are happier than if you're single. So right now, I am single and non-religious. <laughs> so on the two factors where it really matters in all big surveys, I am really at the bottom of the pile and probably a very good subject for uh, trying to make myself happier in the film. Very quickly on what makes us unhappy, all the usual or all the expected things, uh, I just talk quickly about crime. There's a, a wonderful study out by Steven Pinker at Harvard who shows that crime against what the media tells us, has actually declined every single century over the last 20 centuries, including the 20th century, had fewer people that died by the hand of another man than in the 19th, which had fewer people than in the 18th, and so on. If you live now among the Hulis, very colorful tribe in Papua New Guinea, uh, very close to where I was for my second sabbatical, Chances that you, uh, uh, that, you will, that you die by the hand of another man are actually seven times higher than if you live in, very close by here, in Detroit, which I think shares the highest uh, criminal rate together with New Orleans in the United States. Seven times as high. So what that really means is that what means for me, what it means for Steven Pinker is that it actually works, that civilization works, that things actually do get better. And we made this little type film about that. Not CG, this is all shot in camera. The skin away each and every day. Why won't you bleed? Why won't you bleed? Why won't you bleed? many of these little type things are going to be part of the larger film. Of the aforementioned three dozen books, this was my favorite. If you're only going to read one book on that subject, that's the one that I recommend. And I was lucky enough to meet its author, and because his wife is a designer, I managed to talk him into becoming the scientific liaison, the scientific advisor uh, for the film. Uh, he came right out and said, in his experience, the three most valuable and effective strategies, if you want to uh, increase your own well-being, are 
meditation. So I went back to Bali, meditated for three months. Cognitive therapy. I stayed right in New York, looked for a little while for a great therapist and went into cognitive therapy, also for three months, and left the last one for last drugs, simply because it's the easiest. I was for three months on Lexapro and surprisingly enjoyed the experience. <laughs> Jonathan Haidt is part of this positive psychology movement, psychologists who look at healthy people instead of looking at uh, sick people. And so part of that is that you would look at your strengths and see how you could cover up your weaknesses. And very quickly, we figured out my weaknesses. Thankfulness. I really never was a very thankful person, and I found that I could change it. I got much better in that. Sympathetic empathy, another one of my weaknesses, much bigger subject, uh, I won't get into it. <laughs> Humility, I don't really give a shit about. Uh, <laughs> I know a whole bunch of people with a very loud mouth, and I enjoy them very much. Jonathan talks about the uh, conscious and the unconscious mind as a small rider sitting on a giant elephant. And the small rider, of course, thinks he can tell the elephant what to do and where to go, but the elephant really has his own agenda. And, you know, clearly, Right now, we have, pretty much in the West, uh, a free decision of the big decisions in our lives. What we want to do, whom we want to do it with, where do we want to live. And even that clearly is so. If a guy called George thinks of where he is supposed to live, somehow to that guy, Georgia, sounds best. And if there is a guy called Dennis who is wondering what he should become, doctor or lawyer, somehow dentist sounds best to Dennis. And if Paula is thinking of who she's supposed to marry, somehow Paul sounds pretty good. And it's pretty amazing that even though we do make those decisions ourselves, somehow Statistically, there are more churches who live in Georgia, there are more Dennises who become, den who become dentists, and more Paulas who are married to Pauls than it would be viable. This is U.S. statistics, and when I saw that, I have to admit, I thought, my God, these stupid Americans. <laughs> uh, how can they get influenced by something as silly you know, as a name that sounds similar to another name. I looked at uh, my own family. This is my mom, Carolina, marrying my dad, Carl. <laughs> my grandma, Josefine, marrying my granddad, Josef. I'm right now, well, I am actually engaged. Uh, and I ha I'm on a big campaign to talk my fiancé, Vesa, into changing her name to Stephanie. <laughs> I quickly talk about emotions. This is supposed to be sadness, I think. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> Disgust. Surprise, anger, and fear. <laughs> now, if you've paid attention, six main emotions, only one of them is positive. The rest is either neutral or negative. And what that means, it's also it's one of the reasons we have a negativity bias. Uh, we enjoy negative things and hearing and reading about them much more than positive things. 
It's the reason why every attempt to make a positive newspaper failed after a week or two simply because we're not interested. It's the reason why if I read a blog even about our own work, it can be 50 positive comments. If there's one negative one, that's the one that I uh, zone into. And if I look at how we live our lives in general, at least in the West, you know, it's roughly 25 years of learning, then there's another 40 year period of working, then there is 15 years of retirement, and then we basically die. Uh, if you're a woman, you have another two years, and then you die. But uh, <laughs> you definitely will die. Uh, <laughs> my idea is to take five of these retirement years and put them into these working years. So that one thing, it's a lot of fun. Second, whatever I create in these single years actually flows back into my work and therefore into society. And third, my, I have a hunch that when I actually do retire, that I'm going to be so much better at it because I've had all that training <laughs> uh, throughout uh, my life. Jonathan talks about work in these three categories. You can see it as a job. You probably hope that you know, by two in the afternoon, it's going to be five and you can go home. You can look at it as a career where you're much, much more engaged, but you still might have that thought every once in a while you had that, you know, is it really worth my while to work that hard? And then you can see it as a calling where you just would love it even if you wouldn't get paid for it. And it's, I've definitely had vast sections of my life when I saw design as a calling, but it disappears. It's, I have to keep working at it. I realized that being a designer is, maybe it's uh, comparable with being married, that you constantly, or being in a relationship, that you constantly have to work on it in order to keep it alive. Second sabbatical, this was the studio uh, in Indonesia. Uh, first job we did was influenced by the fact that the studio was surrounded by 99 very crappy looking dogs and we basically put them all on t-shirts. Every dog got its own hand-painted t-shirt uh, and then it included a, a fairly uh, threatening message on the back of the shirt. <laughs> the dog still influenced the furniture we designed. I needed furniture because my studio was renovated in New York City while I was in Bali. And the nice thing about Bali is you can just make a crappy little sketch like this and within a couple of weeks, or in this case a couple of months, it is transformed into the real thing. Uh, still the dogs. <laughs> we had a coffee table with a lot of compasses on them and espresso cups that had a magnet hidden in them. And of course, I think it's the law. Uh, if you are a graphic designer doing furniture, you need to do typographic cheers. Uh, here is my version, and I'm actually in two weeks time gonna go to the Philippines where we're gonna do a, not a mass production, but a proper uh, production for a large furniture company of this chair. I also found a repeatable way to create a moment of bliss. And I'll give you the recipe. Nice landscape, a, a road with little traffic so you don't have to wear a helmet a mp3 player with 10 songs on them that I know but don't know too well, so they don't have a lot of baggage. And very important, no purpose, just driving around for the sake of driving around. And every single time I could 
I would have shivers going down my spine. It didn't work when I did it as a commute, when I had to go somewhere else, but every time when it was without purpose, it worked. And I think that I'll do much more work in the future going in that direction. From the sabbatical, maybe the most surprising one was that number three, uh, that even from a financial standpoint, it worked. Because so much ideas were created in the sabbaticals that then, that also commercial clients wanted, that we could actually raise our prices and make back the money that we didn't make uh, while not working for clients. If I ask this question, of course the easy answer is do more of the stuff I love to do and less of the stuff that I hate. Uh, in order to be able to do that, I would need to know what is it that I actually love to do, and I'll show you eight or nine points. One would be to be able to think without pressure. Uh, in this case, BMW gave us a year to do a book about their cultural program, and we came back with a book that had a remote control, so you could drive it around. Uh, <laughs> it is not much deeper than that. That's basically it. <laughs> doing what I'm doing right now, seeing new places and letting those places influence me. Uh, the reason we took on one of our largest clients right now uh, at least from a financial point of view, is because they were in an interesting place of the world. This is a department store uh, headquartered in Beirut, in Lebanon, and we did pretty much everything for them. The identity, the packaging, and uh, we've been for many seasons now also doing their advertising. That's how it's displayed then in Beirut. Two, not getting bored. So, breaking out from sitting behind the screen, doing everything behind the screen, and trying out things that are not digital. In this case, a campaign for Levi's. Uh, they, are, they wanted to, us to do something on the 501. We went out, bought the 501, and took it apart or because same thing, 501, because it doesn't have a zipper, but it has a button fly, hence the flies are uh, made out of buttons, and a billboard for New York, we are all workers, that's the typography, is scrambled and descrambled every 10 seconds. Content. Uh, an organization who wants to cut the Pentagon budget by 15% and spend the savings on education. Uh, I love the content. Very much in the beginning when of this client relationship, I suggested to do this double school bus and the client didn't want to go for it. Uh, and I basically just worn them out. Over three or four years after every meeting, I said, well, how about the double school bus? Uh, <laughs> and eventually, basically to shut me up, uh, they did it, and it became a wonderfully successful program. A volunteer drove, a volunteers drove this bus through the US for four years, wound up on countless TV programs, uh, for, and we got our issue uh, in the public for relatively little money. Still handles pretty well, as you can see. <laughs> Just the joy of having an object come, come back well done from the printer. In this case, a book about a friend of mine, uh, artist Ashley Bickerton, uh, in a very elaborate mother of pearl wooden slipcase. Uh, we worked I think five years on that book, and it was just such a joy to have the final piece then in our hand, and that it's done. Again, 
another thing, not getting bored, as in, if I do things that I don't know anything about, I get too anxious. If I repeat the stuff that I know, I get too bored. So somehow in the middle is very comfortable for me. And so we did this, at this uh, TV commercial for an Asian bank, with basically conscience. with that in mind. Uh, to also to must. be able to learn about can. type in movement As so that uh, I would counts. be better for can our own counted. film. Can it not only look at the profit it makes, but how it makes that profit? and stand beside people, not above them, where every solution depends on each person. Simply by doing good, can a bank in fact be great? In the many places we call home, our purpose remains the same. To be here for people, here for progress, here for the long run, here for good. really getting to know a project by looking at it from all levels. So in this case, an identity project for Casa de Musica, a music center in Porto, in Portugal, built by Rem Kohlhaas, the Dutch architect. We put a mask on it, looked at it from all angles, west, south, east, north, got these six shapes, colored them in, in a very peculiar way by having a friend of mine write a uh, Casa de Musica logo generator machine, which is basically just a piece of custom software in a scanner. You put, let's say, a Beethoven image in the scanner, you get these six Beethoven-like logos. Immediately, if you have to design a Beethoven poster, the logo down here will always fit conceptually, but also visually, because it's the same thing. It comes from the same visual and conceptual information. If Frank Zappa's music is performed, logo looks like this. If it's the Chemical Brothers or Lou Reed, they all get their custom logo. Or in-house, let's say the president or the musical director gets their Casa de Musica portrait in a logo on their business card. And the sub-brands like the symphonic orchestra that lives in the building looks like this, or a smaller avant-garde orchestra looks like this, and all the advertising could be done with using just these shapes. So you have Chopin, Mozart, Lamonte Young. You can take the shape and make typography out of it. You can grow it underneath the skin, put it outside in a, in a, a more, for a more family-oriented event, underneath the parking garage for a rave or a weekly uh, uh, program. And last but not least, getting feedback from people. So in that same reign of the Happy Film, we also created a good number of exhibitions. This one was its first, in, uh, first stop in uh, Philadelphia. And we, they originally had given us two nice exhibition rooms but we said, so what's the story? What are these, all these other spaces, like the wheelchair ramp that you see here? And they said, well, you can use those too. So we did the show, we did extend the show into the toilets, into all the hallways, onto the balconies, onto all the nun spaces. And on the wheelchair ramp, we basically, I cherry picked my favorite research from those aforementioned three dozen books companionate love versus passionate love. You see passionate love after six months being much more superior, but when you look at it from a 60-year point of view, going down pretty badly. Or another interesting piece of Steven Pinker research, number of sexual partners among homosexual men and women in San Francisco before the AIDS crisis, meaning people who could behave however they wanted there's no repercussions. 75% of gay men had over 100 sexual partners and 2% of gay women matched those. Over 28% of gay men had over 1,000 sexual partners and 0% of gay women had that. 
I told this statistic to a, my gay friend in Bali, and he looked at me and said, what, uh, what, uh, like a year? <laughs> the entry, you put 25 cents into here, the 25 cents rolls out of the museum and falls into a bucket outside for anybody to take. <laughs> you push a button, a card comes out, it gives you instructions on how to behave while you're uh, in the show. Uh, very much like what I did at the beginning of this talk, these bubblegum machines check how good or not good people are feeling uh, from, uh, on a scale from 1 to 10. This is at the beginning of the show, but we got a nice curve at the end of the show. Uh, these, this typography made out of sugar cube can actually see the viewer and determine if the viewer is smiling. And when you smile, it becomes colorful. And the viewer instinctively realized that, so we had a whole bunch of smiling people uh, in the happy show. Uh, imported my favorite truffles from Austria, many kilos of them. And because exercise plays a big role, we had this bicycle in the show where, I think I'll demonstrate that in a second, if you uh, are on it and bike, uh, patiently enough, you are generating the electricity that is driving this neon typography that you see in front of you that says, actually doing the things I set out to do increases my overall level of satisfaction. So I'll quickly ask you to look at these cards and remember one. Pick one and remember it. Everybody has one? So the eight or nine rules that I showed you before. Of course, if the easiest to become happier as a designer would be just to follow those rules. The difficulty with it is that it's unbelievably difficult for me, but I think for many other people too, to actually know what makes me happy in the future. One of the reasons is presentism, that I always only look at it from my own point of view right now. And uh, you, know, you know that an example for that would be you go to the supermarket and you buy much too much stuff when you're very hungry, because you, you look at it from your now point of view. Back to the cards we go, and I removed the cards that you picked. True? Not just a graphic designer, but also a magician. Uh, <laughs> but because I don't have to make a living as a magician, I can do what magicians normally don't do. I can tell you how I did that. Uh, I removed, I changed all of the cards. But very much likely, you concentrated only on the one that you picked and ignored all of the other ones. So after all this, I actually did bring you 12 minutes, a 12-minute sort of like shortcut of where we are with the film. I mean, we are much further with the film, but this is the only part or one of the few parts that we started editing on. And I'll just run that and then I'll be back for, it's 12 minutes, and then I'll be back for a minute. So yeah, about 20 years ago when I was a student 
I took the subway and I saw this absolutely fantastic, wonderful looking older lady. She must have been about 85 or so coming into the subway. Black coat, black hat, roses, a lot of red roses in her hat. And I just had this urge to tell her how fantastic she looked. But you know, it's something that you don't really do. Talk to strangers and all that. So I was just sitting there. Should I tell her? Should I not tell her? Should I tell her? And as I was contemplating, it actually became her stop and she left the subway. And just before the doors could close, I jumped out too. It wasn't my stop. And I ran after her and I said, hey, lady, hey, lady, hey. Uh, wait up for a second. I have to tell you something. You are just unbelievably fantastic looking. And her whole face lit up and I myself got a huge kick out of it. And I thought, well, from now on, I'm always going to do this. And sadly, that's not really how it all wound up. Oh, I have to talk myself into it a new time after time again. And I actually do know why this is so. My own brain contains a shortcut, the amygdala, that allows fear to register much, much faster than joy. I can actually feel the fear subconsciously. Before my eye has a chance to send back the images to the conscious part of my brain, my body can already sense the danger. My Stone Age predecessors, of course, were exposed to life-threatening dangers on a daily basis, and it made a lot of sense for evolution to turn their fear way up in order to keep them safe. But I lead an essentially sheltered life free from attacking animals. And I'm convinced that this life would be much richer if I'd be willing to risk more. Not bad. That's All right. Yeah, slam. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a theory out there that if you figure out what you believe in and then really try to live accordingly, that that would somehow elevate your overall level of well being. When I first thought about making a movie about my own happiness, I was actually in a fairly happy state myself. I'm, I think, by and large, if I look back on my life, I've been always fairly happy. I'd say, I don't know, an eight maybe out of uh, ten. I mean, I guess in a way, I was always interested in somewhat improving my own life. Uh, I don't know, on a very low level, starting with a diary that's almost you could call it like an itsy bitsy mini meditation every week. Uh, or I've been grading myself since a fairly long time where in the beginning of the year I would pick about a dozen points that I want to change about myself and then would make weekly ratings on how I did that that week. And it's just been the last year basically that things changed quite radically. In the very beginning of the year, my mom died. Uh, that was a, a very big deal for me because we are very close. I'm the youngest of six kids. Uh, and maybe because of it, I'm not quite sure, uh, maybe because of the, the stress of that, I picked up a very chronic infection in the, in the prostate that has as one of its main side effects just a, you know, fatigue, uh, a lameness, uh, possibly even something that's bordering on, on depression that uh, I can't seem to shake and I've had it, uh, you know, pretty much all throughout the year. The film really is trying out to see if it's possible to train my mind in the same way that I can train my body. I ran a New York marathon once, even though I'm super unsporty. And by training for a year, I got much, much, much better in running. And I just want to see if the same thing could be true for the mind.
Very nice shirt, girl. I love your outfits. You just look great. That's some serious amount of apples that you have there. No, Brussels sprouts. Hi. You look great today. <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, an afternoon's worth of trying out uh, the Maxim having guts always works out for me and see if that is true. So I'm going to do things that I normally never do. So probably the most difficult one is going to be to get a phone number of a girl, which is just going to be terrifying because I never do that on the street. I just, I just never do. So just uh, thinking about it now and talking about it uh, yeah, makes me queasy, to say the least. Uh, but I also recognize that these butterflies in the belly are probably a good thing because normally when I don't have butterflies in the belly, that just means I'm doing the same thing that I'm doing anyway over and over again. Wow, I love that bag. Excuse me? I love that bag. Mm. Wonderful shawl you're wearing. Can I give you a flower? Oh, it's I think okay. it, no, but look, it, look it, it matches perfectly. Thanks yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is so much more difficult uh, than I thought. I mean, this took like 15 minutes just to get rid of a flower. Uh, well, let's see. Maybe I'll do better with the second one. Hi, sorry for interrupting, but you just look fantastic. I'm sorry, I see you're texting, but I just have to comment on your jacket. That is just the nicest jacket I've seen all day long. It is just Thank great. You. Yeah, Thank excellent. You. I mean, it's old. It's, like, it's not bad because it's lined, it's so Can I give you my card? Can, I would love to get together for a cup of coffee at one time. Sure. Look, and I have a flower for you. Aww. That was the first one that uh, halfway decently uh, worked out. I think I'm either I'm not really cut out for this or uh, or maybe I am cut out for this. I just don't have enough practice because I really absolutely never do it. But uh, she definitely at least promised to send me an email. Uh, I didn't quite have the guts to further to really ask her for a phone number after she accepted graciously my card. But I wouldn't, the way she reacted, I wouldn't be surprised if I would actually get an email from Christy. I think we're gonna need the ladder. We're not doing the, that. And what I didn't see in your portfolio is that there is nothing in it that has a lot of information that's well done. Mm -hmm. This actually has a lot of information, but it's not well done. Yeah, not one of your strongest pieces. I think this is great. So I've been doing the salons where designers who just called in and wanted to meet me uh, all come together at the same time and they show their work and I critique it. But for a long time, it was just too easy. Like I said, oh, this is nice. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is lovely. And didn't really give a honest and sometimes harsh review yeah, of it. I hate the menu. It's, it's so, so strange. It's like, this is good and this is terrible. And I thought it was just a waste of everybody's time. So now I'm really trying to be much more honest. Yeah, over the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to be gutsier with very little things. Things just like everyday things that I'm almost embarrassed that I even need any guts to do them. Things like if I want a coffee on the street and I see somebody coming towards me with a coffee, just ask that person where did you get it rather than finding it myself. Or telling a taxi driver to turn the radio down if it bothers me. Uh, you know, I've been known to sit in a taxi and just endure it. And some of this stuff has been tough. I mean, definitely the getting the phone number of that girl was by far the toughest of all. And most of it actually did make me feel better in the evening. <laughs> Well, all throughout this little section of 
having guts always works out for me. I had actually asked friends and family to come up with ideas for me. Like, what would they think uh, would be good for me on a daily basis to try out where to be gutsy? And I have uh, one very close friend in Austria who wrote that I should tell people that I know and like something that I always wanted to tell them but didn't quite have the guts to do so. Well, this friend is in Austria and I'm actually going back to Austria right now. And, well, who knows? Maybe I'll be able to come up with the right opportunity or the right situation to tell her something that I wanted to tell her since a long time. So can we have some more house lights? Uh, <laughs> we'll have to do this one more time. Zeros now. Who feels like shit? Did not increase. Uh, number two, pretty bad. Number four, who is bored after this whole hour? They probably left those bored people. <laughs> Things are okay, number six. Who feels good, number eight? Wow. And who loves life, number ten? That is pretty wild. Uh, now, I, of course, have to admit that I don't think that I can expect that the film, definitely not the 90-minute version, would actually make people happier in very much the same way that I don't expect watching Chain Fonda exercise would make me skinnier. Uh, <laughs> you probably would have to, but my, my hope, of course, and maybe the main reason to do the film in the first place is to, uh, that the hope would be that some people would like to work on this or do the exercises themselves. Now, one of these exercises that I found, and I just started it about a month ago, that I found extremely wonderful and very easy to do is uh, one that deals with the negativity bias that I had mentioned before, that we feel uh, that we are more attracted to negative things than positive things. And in my case, and, but I think in many other people's cases, is that during the day, the stuff that goes bad somehow has a bigger influence on me than the stuff that goes well. And Marty Seligman, who is maybe the most prominent of the positive psychologists, he actually started this whole field and was at one time the head of the psychology organization of the United States. I think I just miss 
norm that, but uh, uh, in any case, he's a, a, a prominent guy in his field, uh, teaches at uh, Penn, uh, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, so he came to the show and I got to know him. And his thing is that every night before you go to bed, you should write down three things that worked that day. And I started that about a month ago, and it's good. It's, I found that to be really helpful. For one thing, that, for one reason, simple reason, because I think about some stuff that's positive before I go to sleep that might influence what I'm dreaming about. But also just, it actually, I was amazed that I had very little difficulty to actually think about three things every, every evening that were kind of wonderful or that I had some sort of reason uh, to be thankful for. And of course you can feel that this is all bullshit. Uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. I'd give you two chances. One is uh, with a quote by uh, this wonderful French philosopher and mathematician by Place Pascal who says that basically everything that we do is geared towards that, that we want to be happier. Even the person who kills himself does it because he thinks he's going to be happier dead. And if you still think that's bullshit, then you can always <laughs> go and visit this guy. <laughs> and I am happy, I am the leg. I am happy, I am the leg. I am happy, I am the leg. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>